Leo Major, the one-eyed scout who liberated a whole town by himself. World War II. In World War II, for the Canadian effort, one soldier stands out from all the rest, Leo Major. He was a French-Canadian from Montreal, Canada. In 1940, at the age of 19, he joined the Le Regiment de la Chaudière of the Canadian Army. Their insignia underlines their fierce fighting reputation, consisting of two crossed Vickers machine guns with a beaver above supporting fleur-de-lis. Private Leo Major first saw action at D-Day in France, taking part in the Normandy landings on June 6, 1944. Straight away, he distinguished himself as a scout behind enemy lines by capturing a German communications half-track full of secret code books. He then forced the captured crew to drive the Hanomag towards friendly lines, but was fired upon with anti-tank guns by British and Canadian troops. Leo had to climb on top of the vehicle to get them to stop firing as they drove closer, and later remarked how happy he was that the British and Canadian soldiers didn't know how to shoot. When the English officer asked Leo to hand over the Hanomag, Leo refused outright, stating that it was a Quebec man who captured it, and so it was handed over to the Chaudière Regiment. His war was nearly cut short when a few days later he was scouting ahead of his unit. Leo unexpectedly encountered a patrolling elite Waffen-SS unit. In the ensuing firefight, he managed to kill four of the enemy soldiers, but one of them, fatally wounded, managed to throw a phosphorus grenade, and Leo was hit, damaging his left eye badly. Leo was then sent to a field hospital for treatment. Leo had to wear an eye patch while his eye healed, and he remarked on how he looked like a pirate. Remarkably, he refused to be sent home, stating that he only needed one good eye to aim a rifle. Quickly, he returned to the front line and continued to act as a scout and sniper for his unit. Shortly after returning to active service in October 1944, he was involved in the month-long Battle of the Scheldt in Holland, which involved much heavy fighting and several amphibious landings. One day during this prolonged battle, Leo's commanding officer had ordered him to find the 50 zombies who had gone missing on patrol earlier. Zombie was a slang term used by Canadian volunteers for unenthusiastic, inexperienced Canadian conscripts in the war. Leo was carrying out the reconnaissance by himself, as always wearing PT sneakers instead of heavy boots. He was deep behind enemy lines, in the dark, in freezing cold rain, muttering to himself. I am frozen and wet because of you, so you will pay. Drenched to the skin while not finding the zombies, he did come across a garrison of German regular troops, sleeping in trenches that they had been digging all day. Noticing a snoring German officer, Leo woke him up, pointing his Sten gun at him, and then motioned him to order his men to follow him. One soldier raised his rifle and was shot dead by Leo, followed by three others who joined the firefight. After this, he shouted, Achtung! and Handenhoch! and the garrison quickly decided to surrender to him. He then single-handedly marched 93 German soldiers back to the Allied lines. But on the way there, they were attacked by Waffen-SS troops manning an artillery battery from a neighboring village, who were infuriated that their fellow countrymen were surrendering. This left a lasting impression on Leo. The Waffen-SS unit managed to kill and injure a number of the German prisoners before being driven off by an Allied Sherman tank. Leo then handed over 93 German prisoners to his speechless commander. For his act of bravery, Leo was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which is the second highest award in the British and Commonwealth, the Victoria Cross being the only one higher. But surprisingly, he declined the medal feeling the British commander, General Montgomery, who was going to present him with the award, was incompetent and therefore in no position to give him that medal. Then in February 1945, as his unit was fighting in the Rhineland in Germany, the Bren gun carrier he was traveling in hit a mine, wrecking the vehicle and killing all its occupants, except Leo. He was severely injured, including two badly broken ankles, four ribs, and his back in three places. Leo again refused to be shipped back home, and after a short spell in a Belgian hospital, he returned to his unit in time for their final attack to clear Holland of the last of its German occupiers. 
So on April 13, 1945, the Allies were preparing to attack the large Dutch town of Zwolle, but were unsure of the strength or deployment of the German forces in the town. That evening, Leo and his friend Corporal Willy Arsenault volunteered to carry out a recon of the area. The city was planned to be bombed by Allied artillery, and this is something Leo and Willy wanted to prevent. When the two approached the outskirts of the silent town, the Germans spotted Willy after his grenade bag made a rattling noise, and he was killed by enemy machine gun fire. Leo took two of them out, but the others fled in a vehicle. He then took his friend's Sten gun, an extra bag of grenades, then laid his lifeless body on the side. So enraged was Leo that he would go on a one-man rampage that lasted the whole night, using his submachine gun and bags full of grenades. He hijacked a nearby German scout car, disarming the driver and taking his MP40, adding a third submachine gun to his inventory. Leo made him drive to a hotel, then entered a bar. There, he disarmed a German officer who could speak French to Leo, and he made him aware that the town was to be bombed by Canadian artillery, which would result in German military and civilian casualties. The officer understood, and in good faith, Leo handed him back his pistol, allowing him to drive off in the hopes that he would evacuate his troops rather than rally an attack. Leo moved around the town for a few hours in the dead of night, firing on any German units he came up against, throwing grenades and making as much noise around town as possible. His idea was to confuse the enemy into believing that they were under attack by a far larger Allied force storming the city. He proceeded in killing or capturing German defenders as he moved from street to street, using the local river and church as reference points so as not to get lost. Every time he had enough prisoners, normally between 8 to 10, he would march them back to the Allied lines and drop them off, before returning to the town to carry on his one-man assault. He is reckoned to have done this around 10 times. Four times in the night he had to force his way into civilian houses to rest. Although terrified by his initial appearance once they understood he was Canadian, they looked after Leo. During his rampage, he also attacked and set light to the Gestapo headquarters, further adding to the confusion. Then, finding the SS headquarters, he engaged in a firefight, killing four SS officers inside. Then, later, Leo came across a group of townsmen by chance. This included a local policeman by the name of Frick Kuiper. All of these men were secretly members of the Dutch resistance. Leo then explained to them that the town was liberated. Then the group went on to take the town hall and bring the civilians out onto the streets. By 4.30 a.m., the German garrison had fled the town, and Leo had single-handedly liberated Zwolle. Leo retrieved his friend Willy Arsenal's body and returned to his unit, who had yet to advance into the town. On that morning of April 14th, the Allied forces entered the town without a shot being fired and without the loss of civilian life from the planned bombardment, due to Leo's outstanding bravery the previous night. For his heroism above and beyond the call of duty, he was again awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal, and this time he accepted it. After the war, Leo left the army and returned to civilian life to resume his old job as a pipe fitter. With the start of the Korean War in 1950, the Canadian Army joined the United Nations forces in fighting the Communist Chinese and North Korean invasion of South Korea. Leo, though only 29 years old, was seen as a veteran with a special skill set and was recruited to rejoin the Army and become a member of a special scout and sniper team. Then, in November 1951, the Communists attempted to take some strategic important high ground just 40 miles away from Seoul the South Korean capital. The fighting was based around the vitally important Hill 355, nicknamed Little Gibraltar, and Hill 277. Chinese troops had captured it from the Americans, and Leo was to recapture and hold the hill. The fighting raged for days, and the Canadian commander, Lieutenant Colonel Jacques Dextras, declared, In the event the battalion is attacked, there will be no withdrawal no platoons overrun, and no panics. During the battle, Leo commanded a unit of around 18 men, repelling whole Chinese divisions while enduring heavy artillery and mortar barrages for three days. Even though Leo had been ordered to retreat when the Chinese divisions counterattacked, he refused. Instead, he demanded that the commander of the mortar platoon, Captain Charlie Forbes, rain mortar fire on the enemy. 
The mortar fire was so close to Leo's position that the commander could hear the bombs explode when Leo spoke on his radio. And it was so intense that the mortar barrels warped from their rate of fire. For his valor and leadership under fire, Leo was awarded another Distinguished Conduct Medal for capturing and holding the Key Hill. Leo was the only Canadian to win the Distinguished Conduct Medal in two separate wars. He lived a quiet life afterwards and in 2008, at the age of 87, passed away, having been married for 57 years and having four children. The Dentist Who Fought an Entire Bonsai Charge Single-Handedly 1944, World War II a dentist often strikes fear into their patients. The dreaded sound of the drill and the excruciating pain that comes with dental treatment is often too much for most of us to bear. Good dental health is important to a soldier, too, as they need to concentrate in battle and not be distracted by a painful toothache. Such a role was assigned to Ben L. Solomon, who was a dentist in the U.S. Army. He was born in 1914 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and had a happy childhood, being heavily involved in the Boy Scout movement. Solomon went on to university and then dental school. When he graduated in 1937, he set up his own successful dental practice in Los Angeles. But then, in 1940, Solomon was drafted into the U.S. Army as America prepared for war. He was initially assigned to the infantry as a private and qualified as an expert in the use of small arms weaponry. However, he was quickly transferred to the Army Dental Corps and was commissioned as a first lieutenant. By all accounts, he was an excellent soldier and liked by all of those around him. By 1944, he had risen to the rank of captain and had been assigned to the 27th Infantry Division, whose nickname was the Orion's Roughnecks due to the unit's Irish New York roots. At the beginning of June 1944, Solomon was finally about to taste combat for the first time, when his division was transferred to Pearl Harbor in order to join a large U.S. amphibious invasion force that was about to set off for the Japanese-held Mariana Islands. The reason why this island group was so strategically important to the U.S. was that capturing them would allow the new U.S. B-29 Superfortress heavy bombers to be stationed within range of the Japanese mainland. On June 15th, after a massive U.S. naval bombardment that had lasted for two days, 8,000 Marines supported by amphibious tanks landed ashore at Saipan, one of the most important islands in the Mariana Island group. The Japanese were well prepared on Saipan, with numerous minefields, barbed wire, pillboxes, and entrenched troops. They would launch several major counterattacks that included fighter-bomber aircraft. Nevertheless, by nightfall, the U.S. forces had secured a beachhead and were pouring ashore in increasing numbers. The next day, Solomon and the Roughnecks landed ashore and joined in the fighting. Over the next few weeks, the Japanese continued to counterattack again and again resulting in heavy casualties on both sides, which often ended in bitter and bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting. With the U.S. casualties mounting, Solomon volunteered to move up to the front line to replace the battalion surgeon who had been severely wounded. On July 7th, just as the battle was finally coming to an end, Solomon found himself supervising a forward field aid station at the edge of the front line, when the enemy unexpectedly launched their final major counterattack. In fact, it was one of the largest assaults by the Japanese during the whole of the Pacific Campaign. In desperation, 5,000 Japanese soldiers had charged forward with bayonets fixed in a near-suicidal attempt to push the Americans back. The ill-prepared Americans were caught totally by surprise by the sheer brutality and scale of the attack. The Japanese succeeded in breaking through the forward perimeter of the American front line and threatened to overrun the whole sector. Nevertheless, Solomon stayed at his post, despite it being less than 50 yards from the front line, and continued to attend to the growing number of wounded that were arriving at the station. Then the situation became much more desperate, as he became aware of an attack on the station by Japanese soldiers. He saw some of the enemy starting to bayonet some of the helpless wounded patients outside the station's main medical tent. Without a moment's hesitation, Solomon grabbed the nearby M1 Garin semi-automatic rifle from one of his wounded patients and killed the enemy soldiers. Then he returned inside of the main tent to try to continue his job of saving the lives of the patients. But moments later, two other Japanese soldiers stormed into the tent itself. Solomon reacted quickly and shot them both dead, only to realize four more enemies were crawling into the tent from the sides. Fearing for his patients' lives and without a thought for his own safety, he rushed forward, attacking the group of enemy soldiers. He kicked a knife out of the hand of the first enemy soldier, then shot him dead. 
He then turned and shot the second soldier, who collapsed mortally wounded onto the floor. Then Solomon, using his own bayonet, killed the third one. But the last of the four proved to be much more difficult, and he became locked in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. Solomon managed to hit the soldier hard in the stomach with the butt of his rifle, winding him for an instant. This allowed a wounded comrade of Solomon's to finish him off with a well-aimed shot. Solomon, realizing the situation would soon become hopeless and wanting to avoid his patients being massacred, ordered the station to be evacuated immediately, while he chose to stay behind to cover their retreat. The last thing that he was heard saying was, I'll hold them off until you get them to safety. See you later. Solomon then single-handedly manned an abandoned heavy machine gun, firing burst after burst into the enemy troops that overwhelmed the station in a mass attack. He sacrificed his life so others could evacuate. When the U.S. Army retook the station a few days later, Solomon's dead body was found surrounded by 98 dead Japanese soldiers piled around his position. It is said that he had been shot 24 times before finally succumbing to his wounds. After he was dead, the Japanese troops had continued to shoot him and bayonet him countless times, leaving his body badly mutilated and barely recognizable. He was just 29 years old at the time of his death. During the three weeks of intense fighting on Saipan, there were around 43,000 American and Japanese casualties. There were also a further 22,000 civilians who had lost their lives in the fighting. So distraught was the enemy at losing the battle that thousands of Japanese soldiers and civilians committed suicide rather than face the shame of surrendering. Solomon was not truly recognized for his selfless heroism and sacrifice until 2002, nearly 60 years after his death, when he was finally awarded America's highest military honor, the Medal of Honor. The reason why it had taken so long for Solomon's bravery to be fully recognized was that the Geneva Convention that governs how wars can be fought stated that military medical personnel cannot use weapons in battle. But the U.S. authorities had misinterpreted this rule as it was meant to apply only in offensive situations, whereas in Solomon's case, he was clearly using it to defend himself and protect his men. Adrian Carton de Viard the soldier who would not die. Sir Adrian Paul Ghislaine Carton de Viard was a lieutenant general in the British Army and was one of the most fascinating combatants in the history of warfare. He was the type of officer who always led from the front and would lead the charge by calling on his men to follow him. Such a fighting spirit resulted in him getting wounded 11 times, of which seven of these were quite severe. During his 34 years of military service and participation in six different conflicts, he lost his left eye and left hand and earned himself the title of the most battle-scarred soldier in history. Adrien Carton de Veillard was the type of man who was born to serve in the armed forces. Frankly, I had enjoyed the war, he had said on one occasion. During his teenage years, he was craving adventure and excitement, so in 1899, when he was 19 years old, he tried to join the British Army to fight in the Second Boer War. The Army wouldn't accept him because of his age, so he enlisted under the alias of Trooper Carton, claiming he was 25 years old. Fighting in a war was a dream come true for Adrian. He said that if the British Army hadn't taken him, he would have joined the Boers instead. It was in this war that he received his first wounds to the stomach and groin. The army was reluctant to let him continue to fight and sent him home to the UK. De Viart's family were furious with him for leaving his studies at Oxford and risking his life in such a dangerous adventure. Yet confronted with his son's determination to build himself a military career, Adrian's father allowed him to remain in the army. De Viard's first commission was in the 2nd Imperial Light Horse. In 1901, he was appointed as a 2nd Lieutenant in the 4th Dragoons Guard. Right up until the First World War, Adrien Carton de Viard served in South Africa and India. Since he was Belgian by birth, in 1907 he decided to become a British subject by taking an oath to King Edward VII. In 1914, de Viard was sent to British Somaliland to help fight the local dervish movement who were led by their religious and military leader, Saeed Mohammed Abdullah Hassan, nicknamed the Mad Mullah by the British. They had risen up against the British authorities in the colony en masse. 
When he arrived there, he was assigned to the Somaliland Camel Corps. This is where he suffered his first severe injury. During the attack on the fort at Shimberberis, Uviar was shot in the arm and the face. The latter injury cost him the loss of his left eye and a piece of his left ear. For his bravery during this action, he received the Distinguished Service Order. Losing an eye, however, didn't discourage him. On the contrary, he was pleased that he was returning to Europe, where he had a chance to fight in the real war. As soon as he recovered, he expressed a wish to join the British troops in France. He threw away the glass eye he had been supplied with and started using a black eye patch, a feature that would become his trademark. On the Western Front, Duviar commanded three infantry battalions and a brigade. During that period, he was wounded seven more times. At the Second Battle of Ypres, shrapnel from the German artillery bombardment shattered his left hand. In the field hospital, Duviar asked the doctor to amputate his fingers, but because the doctor refused to do so, Duviar tore off two of his fingers himself and threw them away. The injuries he suffered that day caused him to have the whole mangled hand amputated anyway later that year. Not even the loss of his left hand stopped him from continuing the war, though. He fought at the battles of the Somme, Passchendaele, Cambrai, and Arras. He was shot in his skull, an ankle, through the hip, the leg, and an ear. During the Battle of the Somme, Duryar commanded the 8th Battalion Gloucestershire Regiment and personally led his men into an attack at the village of La Boiselle. He attacked the Germans with grenades using his one good arm, managing to pull the pins out with his teeth and throwing them. He took control of three other battalions whose commanders had been killed, captured an enemy position, and held it against repeated enemy counterattacks. For his gallantry shown on this occasion, Duviar received the Victoria Cross in 1916. At the time, he was 36 years old. He never spoke about the award as being his own. Instead, he credited it to all the men of the 8th Gloucesters. Duviar ended the campaign with the rank of Acting Brigadier General. At the end of the war, he was sent to Poland as part of the British Poland military mission. His task was to support the Poles in their post-war conflicts with the Soviets, Ukrainian nationalists, and the Lithuanians. On one occasion in 1920, the observation train that he was traveling on came under attack by a group of Cossacks. He returned fire at them with his revolver, but lost his footing and fell off the train. He scrambled back on and continued firing at them. Gradually, he developed a great empathy towards the Polish people and their country. As a result, he decided to spend more time in this country after officially retiring from the army in December 1923. Adrian Duviart would have undoubtedly spent the rest of his life in Poland if it had not been overrun by the Germans and Soviets in 1939. He narrowly avoided capture and escaped the country via Romania to reach the safety of Britain. Upon his return, Duviar was recalled by the army and given his former rank of colonel. In 1940, as a commander of the 61st Division, he fought the Germans in Norway but was forced to withdraw with the rest of the British Expeditionary Force. Then, in April 1941, as an acting Major General, he was appointed as head of the British Yugoslavian military mission. On his way to Yugoslavia, Duviar's plane crashed near the coast of Italian-controlled Libya. He was rescued from the wreckage, but ended up in an Italian prison for senior officers at Castello di Vinciglata. During the two years of his imprisonment, Duviar made five attempts at escaping. On one occasion, he did manage to escape, after he and six other officers had managed to dig a 60-foot-long tunnel to freedom. He spent eight days wandering around the area disguised as an Italian peasant before he was recaptured. His years in captivity ended in August 1943, when the Italian government released him as part of their secret plans to negotiate a peace settlement with the Allies. Once again, Duviar was back in Britain. His last posting in the war was as Winston Churchill's personal representative in China, with the rank of acting lieutenant general. His reports about the event and relations in China provided a valuable insight to the British government about the conditions in this country. The mission there lasted for four years and ended in 1947. In October that year, Duveyar finally retired. On his way back home, he was injured one last time, 
In Rangoon, as he was coming down some stairs, he slipped and fell and broke several vertebrae. The life of this extraordinary soldier and adventurer ended in 1963. At the time of his death, Adrian Paul Ghislaine Carton de Villar was 83. In his lifetime, he had faced death on many occasions, but he never shied away from danger. He was a true example of a ferocious soldier and a great leader of men. Christian Craighead, Obi-Wan Nairobi. It was a warm, sunny Tuesday afternoon, and everywhere people are window shopping and exploring the grounds of the Ducid D2 luxury hotel complex. Located at 14 Riverside Drive, the hotel was at the center of many expensive stores and international office buildings. The Kenyan Commission on Revenue Allocation, INM Bank, Amadeus IT Group, and a host of other businesses dotted the Walden property. For years, this complex in the capital of Kenya had peacefully operated as a host for tourism and international business. That was all about to change on the afternoon of January 15th, 2019. As people sat outside the Secret Garden restaurant, which was just opposite the Ducid D2 Hotel, a man approached and stopped directly in front of the patio seating area. He was speaking very loudly on his cell phone, attracting the attention of everyone in the restaurant. Where are you? He screamed in Swahili into the phone. Some of the customers sitting there began to feel uncomfortable and anticipated that something bad was about to happen. The man's erratic behavior caused an unnerving feeling of suspense. Moments later, the man detonated a secret explosive device located on his body and instantly killed himself and many of the nearby customers. Windows six stories up from the blast were shattered and debris was strewn across the grassy lawn. As the smoke cleared and people ran for their lives, no one could have guessed how deadly the rest of the day would become. Around the same time, at roughly three o'clock in the afternoon, four more armed men drove to the entrance of the compound. At the security gate, the guard's suspicions were aroused and they fired some warning shots at the vehicles. The four men were forced to abandon their vehicle and continue up the street on foot. Approaching the front gate, they threw hand grenades at vehicles parked outside the entrance, and three cars exploded into bright hot flames. The purpose of this second explosion was to create chaos and confusion within the luxury complex, making people become disoriented and easier to trap. After a brief skirmish with the front gate security, the attackers forced their way into the complex. These men were wearing black apparel, carrying assault rifles, and had a lot of extra ammunition magazines with them. Clearly, the attack was coordinated beforehand to cause as much devastation as possible. They split into two groups of two and began systematically moving through the office buildings. Shooting and throwing grenades as they moved up the floors, the group killed anyone that they came into contact with. Kenya is no stranger to terrorist attacks. Ten minutes into the attack, dozens of security personnel began to arrive at the front entrance. Police special forces, paramedics, and armed civilians raced into the complex to begin helping evacuate the panic-stricken crowds. Among those helping was Christian Craighead, a British SAS soldier who was in the country to help train Kenyan soldiers to fight against terrorist attacks. For Craighead, the day had started normally enough. He was shopping at the mall when he received a phone call that there was an attack at the hotel complex. Immediately, this British SAS soldier, who was a member of the elite 22nd Regiment, grabbed his equipment and ran to his car. Weaving in and out of traffic, he pushed his way through Nairobi and toward the Ducid D2 hotel compound. Leaving his vehicle, Craighead could hear the sound of automatic gunfire, and although he had little intel on what was unfolding, he knew that many people were in danger. His training in the British Army had prepared him for this sort of situation. Christian Craighead had joined the Junior Parachute Regiment before his 17th birthday and trained with them for six months before moving on to the program for adult paratroopers. Pegasus Company, also known as P Company, is a pre-parachute selection course that takes place over a five-day period and entails grueling training. Not many pass the course, but those that do have the chance to continue on to the parachute course. After graduating from training, he served for three years as a paratrooper before joining the Pathfinder Platoon, which is an elite unit, part of the 16 Air Assault Brigade. These operators serve as an advance force and carry out dangerous reconnaissance missions. In 2003, he deployed to Iraq and worked in this capacity as a Pathfinder. 
Nine years later, Craighead completed the British SAS's notorious six-month-long selection program and became a member of the 22nd Regiment. The 22nd Regiment is one of the most elite units in the force. From here, much is unknown about his career in the SAS, as the force is known to be secretive and discreet about their missions. What is known is that years later, while training Kenyan soldiers to fight terrorism, he made four gunmen regret the day that they decided to attack the Doucet D2 hotel complex. None of the terrorists could have possibly known that a professional British SAS soldier was quickly moving toward their position to eliminate them. Wearing body armor, a balaclava, and a pair of jeans, Craighead got to work. He carried a Colt Canada C8 series rifle, which is essentially an AR-15 or M4 M16 at its core. The gun was specifically an L119A2, which is a modernized version of the C8 and has a monolithic upper receiver. This serves to make the gun more accurate by zeroing large optics and laser aiming devices. Also featured on the gun was the SIG Romeo 4T optic, which is a premium red dot optic, and a Surefire FA-556A suppressor. Firstly, Craighead helped escort numerous groups of civilians out of the complex. He can even be seen on video footage carrying out wounded people and providing cover for the paramedics. Time after time, he brought people out of harm's way to then turn and head straight back towards the enemy fire. People were amazed by this unknown, masked foreigner who was taking control of the situation and getting all those people to safety. Next, as Kenyan soldiers and police established a perimeter around the compound, he embedded himself within a group of soldiers and started to work, moving through the buildings. Everywhere, people were trapped in rooms waiting to be rescued as they were pinned down by gunfire. However, the soldiers were not able to engage the terrorists directly while administering aid, so Craighead broke off from his group to confront the gunmen alone. More video footage from the scene shows him running away from the friendly soldiers and towards enemy gunfire as he scanned the upper floors of the buildings. Performing a solo sweep of the rest of the complex, Craighead located two of the terrorists, who were now at the back of the compound, and eliminated both of them by himself. Unknown to him and Kenyan authorities at the time, two other terrorists remained active. As the evacuation process continued throughout the day, Craighead continued to help coordinate medical aid and clear floors of the public. However, during the early hours of the next day, January 16th, gunshots and explosions could once again be heard. This time, Kenyan police were able to apprehend the gunmen and announce that the complex was finally secure after the 19-hour siege. Immediately following the attack, no one knew Christian Craighead's identity. Only photos of a masked man aiding people appeared on the internet to give any clues. He became known as Obi-Wan Nairobi, a name which referenced his heroic, selfless actions and concealed identity. A Black Rifle Coffee Company blackbeard patch on his backpack was the only clue to his identity. Only after he made an appearance on the company's podcast was he finally identified as Christian Craighead. He received the conspicuous gallantry cross for his actions that day and retired from the SAS a year later and wrote a book about his experiences in Kenya, including the infamous incident. The Kenyan government was also praised for its fast response to the attack, which had been coordinated by the Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab. Backed by Al-Qaeda, the Somali terrorist organization had planned the attack as retribution against the United States President Donald Trump because he had formally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Although close to 700 people were saved during the evacuations, 27 people were killed by the attacks, including many Kenyans, an American man, and a British South African man, and many more were injured. While the response of the Kenyan police and army personnel is worth applauding, it was the actions of a lone British SAS operator who helped save the day. Christian Craighead had prevented more lives being lost with his heroic deeds and had taken the initiative when he had gone off and killed two of the gunmen on his own. Both the Kenyan government and residents of the compound have come forward to shower Craighead with much-deserved praise and thank him for risking his own life to save complete strangers. So, next time someone blows themselves up in front of a crowded cafe and a small army of terrorists start executing civilians, the world had better hope that there's a British SAS operator around to save the day. Hiromichi Shinohara, the Deadly Warrior of the Skies 1939 
On June 27, 1939, over Tomsak Bulak on the border of Manchuria and Mongolia during the Soviet-Japanese border conflict, a massive aerial dogfight took place involving over 150 airplanes. One of the men in the thick of this fighting was a 26-year-old pilot. His name was Warrant Officer Hiromichi Shinohara of the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force. This was just before World War II had begun, and nearly two and a half years before the Japanese had entered that war, after their attack against the U.S. Pacific Fleet on the morning of December 7, 1941. The Battles of Kalkin Gol, also known as the Nomanhan Incident, are today largely forgotten, but at the time these Soviet-Japanese border conflicts were both bloody and costly. They lasted from May to September of 1939, with over 45,000 casualties and around 360 aircraft destroyed. The air combat was on a scale and ferocity not seen since the aerial bloodbath that was called Bloody April in 1917 on the Western Front in World War I. During the four-month-long border clash between the Japanese and the Soviet Union, it's estimated that both sides combined flew over 12,000 sorties, with nearly 3 million rounds of ammunition being fired and over 2,000 tons of bombs being dropped. The conflict ended in a humiliating defeat for the Japanese. It had its roots back in 1931 when the Japanese invaded Manchuria in northwest China. Relations with its neighbor, Soviet-backed communist Mongolia, quickly became strained and in 1938 erupted briefly in open warfare. This resulted in the Battle of Lake Kasan during the short-lived Changkufeng incident. Though a diplomatic solution was quickly found and hostilities ceased between the two sides, a dispute where the Manchurian-Mongolian border actually was still persisted. On May 11, 1939, a detachment of Mongolian cavalry wandered over the border to find land to graze their horses on. This caused the Manchurians to send a large cavalry detachment who chased off the intruders. Nevertheless, things quickly escalated over the next few weeks, and the skirmishes between the two sides became more and more intense. By June, what had been a minor border dispute had become a full-scale, high-tech conflict involving a large number of planes and tanks including the giant obsolete Soviet Tupolev TB-3 heavy bomber and the very latest Japanese Mitsubishi K-21 Sally high-speed bomber. Towards the end of that month, the Japanese launched a full-scale assault on the Soviet and Mongolian positions in an attempt to bring the conflict to a quick conclusion. This attack would ultimately fail, despite the Japanese offensive being heavily supported by large numbers of their bomber and fighter aircraft. It was, in fact, the first time air power had been used on such a large scale to support an advancing army. It also resulted in some of the largest air battles since World War I. So, the giant air battle over Tomsak Bulak on June 27th was a pivotal moment in the Japanese offensive. Warrant Officer Shinohara had just started flying combat sorties for the first time and was with the 11th Squadron of the Japanese Imperial Army Air Force. They had just been redeployed to the newly built airfield at Sienjo, which was located in western Manchuria, east of the border with Mongolia. The base was highly important as it was the nearest Japanese airfield to the front line. Shinohara was a career pilot who was the son of a peasant farmer. He had risen through the ranks of the Army Air Force after transferring from the cavalry back in 1932 at the age of 19. Though from the start of his career, he had been flying fighter aircraft. It wasn't until seven years later in 1939 that he saw his first combat mission. By the time the Soviet-Japanese border conflict had started, he was flying the modern Japanese monoplane, the Nakajima Ki-27 Nate, which was the forerunner of the legendary Mitsubishi Zero. The Nate was a highly capable fighter aircraft, but lightly armed with just a pair of medium machine guns. Despite this, Shinohara managed to shoot down four of the very latest Soviet Polikarpov I-16 fighters on his very first combat mission. This was an incredible accomplishment as the Soviet Polikarpov I-16, nicknamed the Donkey, was a tough opponent with abilities that easily matched that of the Japanese Nate. Shinohara's dogfighting technique quickly became apparent and was compared to that of a lone wolf when hunting an enemy. He very much liked flying alone, patiently stalking his prey from above until he found the right moment to pounce. So the next day he added a further six enemy aircraft to his tally by using the classic Japanese tactic of swooping down at high speeds on the enemy and then turning sharply, firing as he did so. Using this tactic, he shot down five antiquated Polikarpov I-15 biplane fighters and a Polikarpov RZ Soviet light bomber that day. 
There was a rumor at the time that as one of the escaping I-15 pilots was parachuting to Earth from his damaged aircraft, Shinohara's wingtip clipped the man's chute, causing it to tear and fall apart. This caused the man to fall several thousand feet to his death. It's not known if Shinohara did this deliberately or by accident, but his record was otherwise spotless. Young Shinohara had become a flying ace in just the first two days of going into combat for the very first time. He continued to score more aerial victories over the Soviets in the coming weeks. Then, on June 27th, he shot down 11 enemy aircraft in just one day, a feat only surpassed by a handful of other pilots, who were all Luftwaffe aces during World War II. In July, he showed great courage when he landed his aircraft on the battlefield in an attempt to rescue a downed fellow pilot. But unfortunately, his aircraft was damaged in the landing, so he and the other pilot had to be rescued while under fire from advancing Soviet tanks. By August 27, 1939, he had amassed an amazing 55 victories. In the afternoon, he was escorting a bomber formation over Mohorehi Lake on its way to attack a Mongolian stronghold. Shinohara flew ahead of the bombers to act as the lead aircraft, and shortly afterwards he was attacked by a large pack of Polikarpov I-16 fighters. Shinohara, though hopelessly outnumbered, managed to shoot down three of the attackers before his plane was hit, sending it spiraling downwards in flames, killing him as it crashed into Lake Mohorehi. He had just celebrated his 26th birthday a few weeks before. Recovered from the charred and mangled wreck of his aircraft was a watch, his brass identity tag, a can opener, and oddly enough, a German Mauser Model 1914 automatic pistol he had liberated off a Soviet prisoner of war. Shinohara was posthumously promoted to the rank of Flight Officer Second Lieutenant. Before he died, he had shot down a total of 58 Soviet aircraft in less than 93 days. His tally was never surpassed by any other Japanese Army pilot, though some Japanese naval pilots during World War II went on to shoot down more planes. It is a sad fact that very few Japanese pilots who lived through the border conflict survived the onslaught that was World War II. Such was the intensity of the Pacific War, coupled with the complete and utter destruction of the Japanese Air Force in the brutal fighting at the end of the war in 1945.